Well, we've, uh, we've been in a series. For any of you that are stepping in today for the first time, maybe in at least a couple, three weeks, we're week three into our series, You Asked For It. Uh, a bunch of you guys have submitted questions. We've had 79 questions submitted uh, anonymously, uh, which has been part of the fun because they're just crazy weird questions. They're deep questions. They're impossible to tackle and answer questions, and they're things that just draw us back to the Scripture if you weren't here, um, a couple weeks ago, we started the series and talked about the Bible. A bunch of you, your questions were about, can I even trust this thing? How do we know if it's accurate? How do we know how it came together? How do we know if it's reliable? Uh, and we tackled that for a little bit together on a Sunday morning a couple of weeks ago. Uh, one of our elders, Brett Swiger, joined me here on stage uh, and tried to help uh, a lot of you that, ans uh, that asked the question. And I know in, in passing in conversations, this is a need for a lot of us. How do I study this thing? How do I, on my own, sit down and actually make sense of different parts of this book? And so um, I hope that's helpful. Uh, go back a couple weeks if you want to check that out if you missed it. Last week, we stepped into a very difficult subject matter. Several people submitted questions about homosexuality, about the church in general. How does, the, how does our church specifically interpret scripture when it comes to homosexuality? Um, I, I really appreciate the candor in some of these questions. We've gotten all kinds of feedback this past week. Uh, a ton of it has just been overwhelmingly encouraging and positive. Thank you for that. Uh, I think so many of you got what Tanner, one of our other pastors that just led us in worship, you got what we were trying to do, which is to say, what did Jesus do? He led time and time and time and time and time again with love, with grace. And then he followed it with truth time and time again. Um, and we tried to do that last week. I've got, I've got a couple of friends, and you know who you are, that I love you so much. You came to me, and in so many words you said, hey, hey good job, good job. But I think you could have brought some more truth. I think you could have dropped the hammer a little bit. And to those friends, I'll tell you what I told them. Go back and watch again. Go back and just soak up, especially that first 20, 25 minutes, and ask the Lord what he wants to share with you. I really feel strongly about that. I have a new gay friend that came to me just last week. Um, and she was so sweet. She said, man, I just, I really appreciate today. I learned some things that I didn't know about this church. I learned some things about how you approach the scripture, uh, things that challenge me. And I really appreciate your tone and how you guys brought it. And that meant the world to me. Um, that she was so frank with me and encouraging and grateful and, and had some good things to say about the way our community is loving people well, which is really encouraging. Um, I have a different gay friend uh, that I know better that I just get the inkling, um, less direct conversation so far, but just get the inkling that, that just some, some frustration, some disappointment. Uh, and I say all that to say, you talk about hard things and it's going to be hard. <laughs> There's tension in it. And I think the life God invites us into is filled with tension. And so I want to invite more conversation. I want to invite more conversation with each other. Don't hold back. I want to invite more conversation with our elders, with our pastors. Uh, we welcome that, okay? This is not meant to be uh, dropping truth bombs. This is meant to be relationships and life. So um, today we're in week three, and before we get to a, a primary group of questions that we're going to tackle today, let's start with a couple of fun ones. Um, somebody submitted this question, what does the Bible say about cremation? Um, okay, maybe it's not that fun a question. Uh, I do kind of have this morbid fixation on death, so um, my wife watches nothing but, but crime shows and calls me when I'm out of town. What am I doing? It's midnight, and I just watched another cold case file. Come home. We're all a little bit dark, right? Um, but this is actually a really good question. Uh, it's a serious question, I know, that was submitted. Uh, what does the Bible say about cremation? And you know what? The short answer is the Bible actually barely mentions cremation. Did you know that? We go to the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we read a lot about the practice of burials. That was the standard practice in biblical times, uh, in ancient times for the Israelites, as well as just a couple thousand years ago, we read about the new church, the first Christians. They, they practiced, almost without exception, 
the practice of burial. So let's cut to the chase. Is it wrong? Is it a sin? Well, I would argue no. Um, from what I understand from the scripture, uh, there is no blatant passage we can find that says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, as Christians, we believe that God is going to resurrect us all. All of us who put our trust in him, who begin relationship with him, that, that count on the hard work that he has done, Jesus has done, to, uh, to forgive us and take the place of payment for our sin. We get to live forever, and specifically the Bible teaches us that he will resurrect us. We just had a funeral uh, in this space where you are just a few days ago. Um, for those of you that, that know uh, Susan Terry, uh, she lost her husband Mark recently. Be praying for them. I know a few of you were here for the funeral. Uh, funerals are meant for the living. Funerals are meant for the living to, to, for us to, to do a couple of things, to grieve together. It's, it's good and right to just feel that loss of people we love. And they're also meant to, to help us remember, help us celebrate the life that our loved ones have experienced. They also remind us that all of us as Christians get to come face to face with our Father in the end. And that he is going to actually bring us back to life. He is going to give us new bodies. That's probably where I want to land with this question is um, for those of us that are missing a limb or blind or deaf or have had cancer ravish our bodies in this life or Alzheimer's destroy our minds or all the things that are not as they should be, um, we don't get those bodies back. We get new bodies. We get whole, full, real good bodies. That's what the Bible teaches us. So I think that speaks a little bit into this notion of is cremation bad? Is it okay? There are some people that teach that it's, it's not okay. I really just don't find that in the scriptures. I do want to add this, too, on a practical note. Uh, burials are really expensive. And uh, let's keep it real. Um, some of us are ready to pay for those things for our loved ones. Uh, a lot of us, it's just overwhelming. That's one of the things to, to tackle in our grief is, oh, my goodness, I didn't know it cost so much if you haven't planned ahead. Uh, cremation is a lot cheaper. I think that's why we're seeing a lot more of it in our culture. Um, but I would, I would land on there's nothing wrong with it. Another one of you asked uh, an even more serious question, I would, I would argue. How can I get my husband to do the dishes? Um, that may have been my wife. I don't know. She hasn't fessed up to it. Uh, I, <laughs> um, and I don't mean to be sexist, uh, but the que I'm, I'm just reading the question, okay? It doesn't say, how can I get my wife to do the dishes? It says, how can I get my husband to do the dishes? I, I want to give you some gold here because this has actually been an issue in my house. Uh, I am a words of affirmation guy. That's my love language. You tell me I'm awesome. You, you tell me I'm a good dad. You tell me I did something really well, and I can just float through the air. I mean, it's just, it's, it's wind in my sails. Uh, you do something for me, like sacrificial. You just, you bless me in some kind of serving way, and it just, I just miss it. It's just not how I'm wired. And so my poor wife will wash the dishes, and she will do the laundry, and she will, she will fold my clothes, and she will just serve me in so many blatant, tangible ways, and, uh, and I just miss it. We've had this conversation. Let me give you some, this is gold, all right? How do you get your husband to wash the dishes? First of all, you ask him, okay? Um, that's always a good place to start. You ask nicely. You use your charms. Ladies, some of you, you know, you can make us do almost anything. Uh, but secondly, this is what worked in my house. You leave them dirty. I'm not even being funny. You leave them dirty because then they pile up in the sink and then they pile up on the counter and two, two and a half, three days go by. And I promise you, your husband will be like, what in the world? For me, I'm like, where's the maid? We don't have a maid, right? And I have found myself, my wife started doing this in the last year, 30 years of marriage this July. She finally started doing this and it, it just, it, it's hard for her. She's a little OCD and she just, she just decides I'm going to leave him dirty. And guess what? I'm finding myself doing the dishes more. So leave them dirty. If that doesn't work, um, I've got a list of counselors I can, I can recommend you, okay? Um, well, we're going to get to several questions, the meat of what we're going to talk about today. Obviously, we're going to have some guests here in just a moment. We're going to talk about money. Several questions that y'all 
submitted were about money, um, which doesn't surprise me one bit. Money is a common denominator for all of us. It is a source of fun in some ways, pleasure. It's also just a, a total stressor and, and central to everything we do every day. Money's, money's a big deal to every single one of us. Several of you asked specifically about money and the church. Um, one of you asked the question, why do we give money to churches? Somebody else asked, is it an important part of Christianity to participate in monetary donations to the church? Why or, why or not? Somebody else said this, is it more important to God that I give when something really touches my heart instead of just the boring day-to-day -day operation of the church? Somebody else mentioned, where in the Bible does Jesus speak about tithing? Great question. Specifically to the church. There's actually several more questions all about giving, about the church and money. Um, I want to boil it down to this, if I could kind of group these questions up. I think what I hear a lot of these questions saying, what's the deal with money in the church? What does the Bible say? And specifically, what did Jesus say? I mean, if we're Christians, if we want to follow him faithfully, I, I think this is where we land. What's the deal with money in the church? What does the Bible say? And specifically, what did Jesus say? Jesus carries a lot of weight for me. Uh, I hope he uh, Let's look first at the Old Testament. Let's go back to what the ancient Hebrews were told to do. This is law, Leviticus. We were in Leviticus last week looking at Old Testament law and asking the question, does that pertain to me or not? Do I blow that off? Because there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament law we don't, we don't follow as Christians, right, as New Testament believers. This is Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. It says, one-tenth of the produce of the land, 10%, of all the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. This is where we get this, this idea, this ancient practice of what we call tithing, of giving one-tenth, giving 10% back to God. In case you're wondering, where did that come from? Uh, Old Testament law, Leviticus 27. And then later we get into uh, the Proverbs, which are written, uh, the Bible tells us, by the wisest man who ever lived. Uh, they're general truths, general promises. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Again, there's this agricultural language, surprise, surprise, to what we read in the scriptures way back then. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Whatever you have, honor him. Uh, worship him with your stuff, with your money, with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. This is a, one particular English translation. Uh, the New Living, which we often read out of here, and I usually teach out of, actually says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the best of your crops. What this really is saying to us, don't give God your leftovers. Give him your firsts. Give him your bests, uh, that's convicting for me. I, I think when I think about my journey in giving over the years, especially early on in my faith, I would give, I would meet a need around me if I had some leftover, if, if it fit that month. Or, or more, more commonly, I would operate on the front end, well, like, well, I'd like to help or I'd like to give, but let me just wait and see if I have leftover. And that's just not what we read in the Old Testament. Give him your, your one-tenth. Give him a, a huge chunk of what you have. It's not yours anyway. And King Solomon says, and don't give him the leftovers. Give him your best. Give him your first fruits. The Bible tells us that tithing, giving the first 10% of our income, it's a way to show God that we trust him. It's, it's a tangible way. Think about the tangible ways you love your spouse or your parents or your kids. The tangible ways mean the most, right? It's a tangible way for us to show God that we trust him with our lives, that we trust him to take care of our needs. Uh, it's certainly not for him. Uh, for some reason, sometimes I can think that it's for his benefit. God doesn't need our money. <laughs> no matter how big the check we're writing, God doesn't need our money. No, it's for our benefit. It's for our benefit because giving sacrificially, it, it 
it creates this dependence that we, we need to have on him to meet all of our needs. And I would even argue it creates, it, it heightens our awareness of the other needs around us. There's something about giving and choosing to be generous and trusting God that, that in my life, in my journey, has allowed me in greater and greater ways to just be aware of the needs of other people around me. I, I don't even think we talk about that much when it comes to money. Okay, but why give to the church specifically? It's a fair question, right? Giving to the work of the local church, I would argue, enables and empowers the church to actively be the church. And I want you to think about that for a moment. What you think about this statement has everything to do with what you think the church is. If, if you or I think the church is an organization, the church is an institution like the government, uh, some nameless, faceless machine, then um, that, that's a great reason to not give. That's a great reason to go, I don't want to do that. I think there's this growing distrust in our culture of institutions, right? All kinds of institutions. Um, but that's not what the church is. The less we can think of the church as 4300 Maplewood Avenue, the less we can think of the church as this auditorium or that kid's building or this campus, the less we can think of it as an organization led by that guy and these other professionals, and the more we can see what Scripture teaches us, that the church is the movement of God. The church is the embodiment of Jesus in a group of people that he wants to love the community through. He wants to bless others. He wants to raise up more and more little Jesus is. That's what Christian means, little Christ. That's the church. Giving to the work of the local church, the movement of God's people, enables and empowers that movement of God's people to be who they are meant to be. Let's shift our, our perspective to Jesus, because this, this always speaks loudly to me, like I said before. What does Jesus say on this subject? We're going to jump into uh, the middle of a rant. Jesus uh, was on a rant. Uh, I told you that Jesus over and over and over and over again led with love and grace. Uh, there were a few exceptions where Jesus came in dropping truth bombs. And guess who he always, over and over again, saved those rare moments of truth bombs for? religious leaders, not the people on the edges, not the people who didn't believe in him or trust him yet. No, religious leaders, that's who he led with truth. And we're going to jump into a rant in the book of Matthew where Jesus is, oh my goodness, he is, he is not okay. He is not happy at all with the religious leaders of that day. Jump into Matthew 23, 23. Jesus says, what sorrow awaits you. There's a different English translation that says, woe to you. You don't even know what's coming. And there's a list of things he, he gives them woes about all kinds of things. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees. Hypocrites, he calls them. For you are careful to tithe. Here's that one-tenth. You're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. You are meticulous. You're so tightly wound with your religious performance. You are, you are focused on tithing, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. What does Jesus say over and over again? That I, I don't care about the religion stuff. I care about relationships. I care about people. I care about hearts and minds. You are so focused on, on checking the box that you are leaving out what's most important. Justice, wrongs being righted, mercy, my tenderness, my forgiveness toward people, faith, just sharing the good news of who I am and what life is really all about. That's what I want you to focus on. And check out what he says after this. You should tithe. Yes. But do not neglect the more important things. This is, this is one place we have Jesus going, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good practice. Yes, I believe that that leads to really good things. It, it creates dependence 
on me. It, it opens your eyes to, to me as provider. Just don't neglect the even more important things. Don't neglect those relationships in your own homes, those relationships in your workplaces. Don't neglect the opportunity to love people really, really well. Bottom line is this. This is what I see. And I, I'm, that's all we can offer, right? You asked for it, so this is what I see as your pastor. Tithing to the church is biblical. It, whether we think it's old-fashioned or, or legalistic, um, it is biblical. It's in the Old Testament. It's brought up again in the New Testament. Tithing is biblical. Jesus cares about our hearts, and tithing is a spiritual discipline of the heart. That's what it means, to, to give our 10%, to, to give sacrificially to the church. It's time and time again, it's getting our hearts right. God doesn't need our money. It, it's, it's getting our hearts right with him. It's, it's choosing to be dependent on him. I want to bring this up today, too, um, because this has spoken loudly to me in my journey wrestling with, with money stuff. God, over and over again in Scripture, says, uh, don't test me. Hey, stop that. Stop bargaining with me. I, I, this is not cause and effect. You don't say, hey, I think I'll do these things if you'll come through in this other area. That's not, that's not how it works. God says that over and over again throughout the Scriptures, except for one area. Did you know this? Money. I've, I've always been fascinated by that. It's a little confusing to me. Why does he say over and over again, hey, don't, no, 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 stop. Don't test me. I am your holy God. Just trust me. And then it comes to money. I think he knows where our hearts are. What does it say in Malachi 3, verse 10? God says, bring all the tithes, all the 10% first fruits into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. Bring it, bring it all to the church. Bring it all. Bring, bring the tithes. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. I triple dog dare you to take him up on this. I love stories coming from the people I get to do life with that, that at one point or another say, you know what, I finally, I finally said, okay, God, all right, okay, okay, let's see what you got. I'm going to do this thing that doesn't make any sense. And I think this might be foolish. Let's see, let's see what you're going to do. And over and over and over again, there are stories of God taking care of needs. Um, now, don't get me wrong, this is not, this is not health and wealth gospel, prosperity gospel. This is not, you know, oh, if you do this for God, he's going to make you rich. That's a bunch of bunk, okay? There's some con artists out there making some money off of that in Jesus' name, and I woe to them, you know? That's not what this is. This is God saying, you can trust me. You can trust me. Give me your 10%. Give me your first fruits. Give sacrificially, even if it hurts. I will take care of you. I will open your eyes to my goodness, these words are highlighted in my mind. If you do, I will pour out blessing. Trust me. I think this speaks to um, something I want to put in front of you all today. Um, we talk about this a lot. We can go ahead and throw that scarcity versus trusting God. I think so many of us, this, this has got to be a, a screenshot we save. Um, I invite you to take a picture of it. If you get your discussion questions, if your if your notifications are on in your uh, in your app, midday today, you'll get some questions as we always send out follow up each week, and it's going to have this image in there. This first group on the left, it's where so many of us live. It's where so many of us, I think, time and time again, revert back to, even if we we think we've we've crossed this bridge, and it's this mindset that there's just not enough. Do you feel that way about your finances? Do you feel that way about, about what you're overwhelmed with, with debt, with financial stress? Honey, how are we going to get out of this, those conversations? This is where we live. There's not enough to go around. If I give 10%, for example, I'm going to have even less than I had before, and it's not going to work out. We have this scarcity mindset. 
even though he provides, we, we consume, we burn stuff up, we spend, we freak out, we lack, and we fear. And then God provides because he's so good. And this cycle just continues. We just live in this, this state of anguish. I think that's the heart of our financial stress. And this is not the life that God invites us to. This other side is what he invites us into. Trust me. To me, that's the gospel in two words. Trust me. In every area of life. God is providing. Same God on both sides of the ledger. God's providing. And instead of consuming, we love him back. We worship him. We choose to love him. We choose to give and to share and live life like this. And what does he do? He multiplies. I will pour out a blessing so great you don't have room for it. Try it. Test me. He multiplies. And then what happens? Oh, we don't talk about this enough. Our faith grows. Anybody want to be more mature spiritually next year than this year? Anybody want to have more faith in Jesus next year than this year? Did you ever connect it to giving? Did you ever connect it to living like this? Because I believe this is truth. We love him back. We worship. We give. He multiplies it. And when we watch him do these crazy things, we grow. We grow more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And then he provides again. And there's this beautiful, beautiful rhythm that we're living in. It's why, it's why the first Christians were sharing everything. They weren't sharing 10%. They were sharing everything. Oh, you have a need? Take, take this. They were, they were spending time together in each other's homes and sharing everything they had. It sounds a little communistic, doesn't it? It just freaks us out, you know? Um, this is where God calls us, to trust him. I want to invite up some friends with the time we have left. Uh, Eric and Jennifer and Wayne, you guys can go ahead and come up. Um, we've got some friends. Uh, Eric and Jennifer have spent the last maybe three months or so with me and about 13 or 14 others in a Rooted group. You've heard us talk about Rooted uh, a few times a year. We talk about that a lot. Um, and then Wayne is a longtime friend. Wayne, you can sit over here. Thank you. Wayne is uh, Colonel Waters. Don't mess with Colonel Waters. He's a flight instructor. Are you in charge of everything at the base now? Okay. Pretty much in charge of everything at Shepherd Air Force Base. But he used to be one of our elders. He's a good friend of mine and also the leader of my group. I'm not the leader of my small group here at church. Uh, Wayne and his wife, Cara, lead us really well, have, open up their home to us. So I, wanna, I want you guys to hear from them. Let's start with uh, the Kershinskis. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about who you guys are briefly and your connection here to Colonial. Okay, I'm Eric. Uh, this is my beautiful wife, Jennifer uh, Kershinsky. We've been married 23 years. We've got three wonderful children, uh, one daughter and two boys. We've been uh, part of Colonial for 20 years now, uh, just about 20 years. Um, it's always been home to us. We've always loved Colonial. Um, I started following Christ because of Colonial. I've been baptized here in Castaway Cove. Um, so we've been part of this for a while, but now we're starting to really get more involved and in really loving the people, and that's just making us so much better. So. Love it. Love it. A testimony in, in another time of how you can be a part of something for a long time and, and not connect it as much as you want, and I just I love what God's doing in you even in this season. Who knew, 20 years in, to really pursue relationships. Tell us, um, tell us specifically how your perspective on money has changed over the years? Well, for me, um, I used to always think if I just had more money, I'd be happy. If I just had the newest car or a bigger house, if I had what all my friends had, I'd be happy. Mm. And in doing that, you start raking up debt. And then before you know it, you're in debt and you can't even pay your bills, you can't buy food, and it's just, it's horrible, but the older we've gotten, and then, you know, giving and getting back on our feet, we see now that money is not the root of happiness at all. It, it's not even ours. So I don't view money anymore as something that's going to make me happy, and I have to have a lot of it. 
Yeah, for me, it used to be, uh, I, I thought I was in control of the money and made horrible decisions. And if I look back now and think if I would have just said, what does God want me to do with this money? Those decisions wouldn't have been made. Mm. So now I can go, what do you want me to do with this money? How can I reach out with this money? So mm. it's made my life so much more freeing on money. So you guys have implied some growth over the years in this area. How, how especially looking back and all the way to what you're experiencing in the day now, how, how have you, what, what does generosity look like for y'all? What does sacrificial giving look like for y'all? Um, it's hard to talk about, um, hey, look at me, look at the good stuff I'm doing, but I'm, I want you to, to, in a really good, excited you know, way, we've talked about this, just be honest with us about how you've seen some growth in that area. Okay, so um, that back in the day when we were first together, you know, you would get your paycheck and you're thinking 10%, can't happen. I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. Um, we wouldn't be able to buy food. And so a lot of times we didn't give. And um, we would earn a little bit more money and I'd be like, okay, I can't give 10%, but I'll give what I can. And I would give what I can. And then sure enough, it may not be a financial blessing that came back. It could be something that just was so good that you needed or, you know, something was given to you that you were needing. And then we started noticing when we would give, things just seem to go so much better. Mm. And I, I mean, it has come to the point now where we were blessed so much. I truly believe through our giving that we were able to get out of debt. We were, you know, so many things came to us that we weren't even expecting. And being generous is so much easier now. We're able, if there's a family in need or even a family member in need, we're able to bless them. Mm. And it's without even a thought that I'm not worried that if I give this, we're going to struggle because I've seen firsthand that God's going to bless us because I've seen it when we don't give and when we do, and there is a huge difference and it is scary. It is very scary knowing I'm about to hand over this money and I might need it for an emergency or I might need it for something else. It's scary to do that. But once you, once you do it and you see the blessings that you get, it starts to get not scary anymore because you know, you're going to be okay. Mm. You want me to add to that? If you have something <laughs> to say, go ahead and add to it. Let me, let me put you on the spot, because one of the things I remember talking to y'all about, because probably, probably one of the question askers said, okay, but why the church? Like, what? oh, you just got excited. I, got I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> because, because I think probably for a lot of us, and I know someone submitted this question, well, I, why can't I just give to this cause over here? And wh why is God, why wouldn't God, why wouldn't God be okay with that? Uh, there's an argument for that. What What are your thoughts? Because I enjoyed hearing you get all okay. fired up about that. <laughs> okay, so I'm asked a lot, like, why do I give to the church? I don't get the instant satisfaction of seeing what my blessing does. I don't know where my money even goes. Mm. So I don't see the point in giving to the church. Okay, so if you don't give to the church, how does this building run? You may not see the blessing, but without your tithing, the lights can't come, the water can't run. We can't meet as a family here at church without that. And so you don't see the blessing, but just know that without the doors open, nobody would be coming in. There's so many people being blessed. And just seriously, guys, serving. If you serve, you will see where your money goes. You will see over in Kid City that... Um, your money is put to use so these little people can learn about Jesus. I think we just ran out of money. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or I got cut off. That's Let's just keep going and we will pretend that has nothing to do. Okay, that's funny. I wasn't now, quite sure what to expect on that. Well one. said, though. Well said. And, and, you know, I work here and, um, I mean, part of my livelihood is from your tithes and offerings. So let's just call a spade a spade, you know, as they say. But for you, um, it means so much for me to hear that coming from you as a mom, as as one who, you know, neither one of you guys, you know, work here and, and have anything to do with that. You just see 
that despite the unseen blessings, you, you can wrap your brain around all of us being blessed and therefore turning around and being a blessing to others. It's, it's an exponential thing for sure. Absolutely. Well said. Absolutely. And kids, you know, they're our next generation and we're planting those seeds early yeah. for them. And so they're over there and they're learning about Jesus and how to live, mm. you know, life to be happy and live for Jesus. And yeah. what we do here is amazing and giving to the church allows us to do that. Mm. Well said, well said. Let me turn my attention to you, Wayne. Um, you've been following Jesus for quite a while. Tell us about, tell us a little bit about who you are, your connection to Colonial First, and then just give us a, a picture of your spiritual journey uh, for you, for your family, when it comes to, to giving, to tithing, et cetera. So we've been here at Colonial for about 10 years. Um, my wife, Cara, Jacob are over here. Um, in fact, we're here because of the Swigers. Uh, they invited us here a long time ago, um, and we've been here ever since. But I grew up in the church, and I, I was not giving on a, on a regular basis um, until I got married. And my wife just simply asked me, like, are we going to tithe? And I said, yes. And then I went, did I just say that? <laughs> because it was convicting like now I've got myself in a position where I, I don't want to lie to my wife I do want to honor our marriage with God and it was it was kind of that shot through the heart like now I've got to put my money where my mouth is right literally and so um, we started tithing and and trust me that first check that we wrote was really hard because I, I didn't know what was going to be covered and what was not going to be covered and there were certainly things that I wanted, but we did it, and we've done it ever since. And, and I don't say that to pat ourselves on the back. I say that because I've seen exactly what um, Jennifer and Eric said. I've seen the return. Uh, I also feel differently about money. I, um, it's a different feeling when you feel like you've helped other people. Um, you're a little less greedy. You're a little less selfish. And um, it is a lot of trust and faith to take that step. Um, and it was a difficult one, trust me. Um, I sat there for probably a good 10 minutes trying to fill that check out. Uh, and, and ever since, it, it has not been a problem because we're not in control. I, I'm, I'm a business major. I follow the markets a lot. And I saw after COVID, the market tanked 50%. Um, and so that can happen and has happened in our past. And so I... I now know differently about money because of that faith that I've had and other things along the way. I won't go into a lot of detail, but if you've never done financial peace, I highly recommend it because if you don't know much about money, Dave Ramsey does, and uh, he is really good at teaching the principles, biblical principles about giving and staying away from debt. And so I thought a few years ago, oh, I'm a business major, like I, I know. And I had not done financial peace, but then when I started listening to him and hearing some of his principles about running from debt and then doing that, like that was, that was, it changed my life. So I highly encourage you to consider it, um, giving, even if it's just a little bit at, at first, um, and then consider something like following Dave, Ra Dave Ramsey or getting involved in something uh, that teaches the biblical principles of money. On that note, we, uh, we just finished a semester where a small group studied financial peace it's called FPU financial peace university and uh and I don't know if we're going to offer it again in the fall but I hope we do but that's that's something very seriously to consider can I, I'm going to put you on the spot I did not tell you I was going to ask you this um and you can draw from Ramsey or your own thoughts what about there are a ton of us in the room we won't raise hands or admit it um I won't put you on the spot out there but there's a ton of us that have debt uh the numbers tell us Americans in general are upside down, overwhelmed in debt. Where does that play in to this, this command from the Lord to give our first fruits to him, to, to tithe, to give to him faithfully, to give sacrificially? What, what, are your, what have you learned about that, Wayne? Well, and I've, over time, and this has been a journey, just trusted God, like the first of our income goes to the church. Uh, we have a couple of other places that we give. Um, and then, according to Dave Ramsey, if you can set up your own emergency savings account, like one to three months, maybe even six months, um, that's where you should start, and then paying off the debt. 
Um, and, and a little bit of the time, you know, certainly helps uh, in the long run. And it is so freeing to not have that debt lingering over your head because left to our own devices, we do want more things. And then that's what's really gonna get us in trouble to get in more debt, to get more things, but eventually that will, that will hurt. You'll become a slave to the lender. And those are strong words. And I think the more I think about it and have gone through what we've gone through, that is totally true. Like it is so different not having that same level of debt. Um, so yeah. And if I hear you correctly, um, biblical principles, especially as, as where Ramsey's coming from, encourage us to still give our first fruits, still, still choose first and foremost to trust him, which for all of us that struggle with debt, that's, that's going to be even more overwhelming. And even that writing those first checks and, and that kind of thing is pretty, uh, pretty big challenge. Um, I, I want to remind all of us today that the way of Jesus is not like all the other ways. That um, whatever metaphor you want to use, swimming upstream, going against the grain, uh, refusing to go with the crowd, um, the way of our culture is to get more and more, keep up with the Joneses, uh, he who dies with the most toys wins. It's, it's, it's very prevalent for us, and I face the same temptations y'all do, uh, and yet the way of Jesus is to remember that it's, it's all him all his, all his stuff, and relationships matter. In fact, I want to, I'm going to be really clear as your pastor, I don't want to get, I don't want us to get lost in the commandments to tithe, to give him our first fruits, and miss that there is room in this local church, for example, to be the messy, not quite like we ought to be, uh, covered in his grace people. And uh, we've got to extend grace to each other. Still talk about the truth and do it in a really loving way. But, but my goodness, he wants us to love each other well and, and be uh, incredibly gracious about it. I'm, I'm inspired by you guys. I'm inspired by you and your family that we've gotten close to and several of you all out there that just give so faithfully and, and choose to trust God and see him, see him show up. Let me, let me close with this. Um, Paul, who was the leader to the first Christians, this is what he said about giving. He said, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. you got to listen to God. you got to figure this out. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. So, oh my goodness, if you're, here, if you're feeling pressure today and a few minutes of conversation, that's not from the Lord. Certainly not our intent. But don't, don't give because of that. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. And then Paul quotes the Old Testament. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. He cares about the heart. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Do you see this truth that just permeates the scripture? This is a word to us today as New Testament Christians. I want to encourage you to continue to wrestle with this. Um, one of our radical minimums uh, for sure is give sacrificially. We believe God wants us to give sacrificially to our families and to our faith families. Another radical minimum that we hold fast to here at Colonial is to listen intently and to ask God, okay, what, what are you saying? What are you saying to me? What do you want me to do about it? And I, I really want to encourage you as your pastor to take this subject and do just that. Ask the Lord, what, what are you saying to me? And what do you want me to do about it? Uh, we've got some more questions. I'll go ahead and tease this. We're going to tackle this on the podcast. Uh, each of the last couple of weeks, we've got timestamps on our podcast show notes. So you can, you can even just find that one or two questions that really interest you. And you can just listen to that if you want to. Uh, this week's podcast, we're going to talk about, some of y'all have asked, how do we hear from God? How do you know when he's talking? That's really him. Uh, I want to I understand prayer better. We're going to talk about that. Uh, one of you asked a bold question about sex and marriage. Uh, we're going to talk about that. I haven't, haven't told uh, our other pastors we're going to talk about that, but we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Um, and then I do want to remind you, if you didn't already know, uh, if you call this church your home, if this is your home, if you consider yourself a part of 
the Colonial Church family. Uh, we want to make sure you know we're having a church family meeting right after this. Uh, within just a few minutes, give you time to get your kids, that kind of thing. We're going to be over in the other building, 242, upstairs in what we call the loft. Uh, please make time for that if this is your church family. We're not going to go uh, into the lunch hour for more than a few minutes, but we really want to talk about some important stuff going on here as a church. Uh, I even want to encourage you, for those of you that have kids, you can bring your kids in there. might be a little bit uh, boring for them in the time we're in there. might be a little bit less engaging, but you certainly can bring them in. If one of you wants to take the kids home, uh, families out there I'm talking to, um, and one of you wants to kind of represent the family, be there for, the, for with us, that's fine too. Um, but I want to go ahead and, and remind our response team, I'm going to pray for us, and then if the response team would come up front and just be ready to, to pray with any of you and to, uh, to answer questions um, and to talk about uh, how you can get involved here at Colonial, that's what our response team is for. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. Um, I speak on behalf of your whole church family. We love you. We want more of you. We want to understand you more. We want to be more faithful uh, tomorrow than we are today. Would you continue to grow us up, myself included? Would you continue to teach us new things? Would you stretch us and build up our faith, specifically when it comes to stuff and money? Uh, would you make us different? Would you, would you have your way with this, God? Would Colonial Church uh, be one of many, many churches in our community, I pray, that would honor you and represent your heart well and that would be a blessing, an outward-focused blessing to our community. Um, would you meet the needs of us personally? Would you meet the needs of our church so that we can be faithful to you? Challenge us in this area, Father, of giving and trusting you. I thank you for the ways you continue to do that for me. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you all. We'll see you.